very nice this morning. Our New Testament scripture reading is from a very familiar passage out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of God. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the King of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day, this day of celebration, this day of praise. We ask now that you would open up our hearts and give us a, a deeper understanding uh, of what happened on that day. So many years ago as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was entering as God's Messiah, God's champion, but yet he had to face the cross. We pray that you would open up our hearts and teach us this morning through the Spirit. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 18, the passage that Jane read a short while ago, gives us a vision of a future event. There are phrases in that psalm that bring to light the images of Palm Sunday. And I'll show you what I mean. Psalm 118, 19, and 20 says, Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. Now these words paint a picture of the gates entering Jerusalem. The walls surrounding Jerusalem. There was the main gates through which to enter. And the psalmist says the righteous will enter into these gates. Then the psalmist says this. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So the psalmist what was saying, God is going to take this righteous one who is rejected by the authorities, who is rejected by the people, and this righteous one is going to become the chief Cornerstone. This righteous one is going to become the unexpected king of kings. Then listen to verses 26 and 27. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us with boughs in hand. We join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. And so now the scene expands in this vision from Psalms. We, we see God's champion has arrived and the people are shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're waving these boughs from the trees. They're waving these palm branches. Now, of course, these images from Psalm 118 were written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. But in them, we can see the people lining the streets. We can see this humble carpenter riding on the back of this donkey. We can hear the shouts of Hosanna. And, and we can even sense the suspicion and the consternation of the Roman authorities and the Jewish religious leaders as they see this crowd gathering, fearing that, that this Jesus, this king, self-proclaimed king is going to, to cause trouble as, as the crowds begin to gather. 
and, and begin to shout their praises. So Psalm 118 sets uh, the stage for the triumphal e entry. If we listen to Jesus' words again, we even get a, a deeper insight into this. Matthew 21, 1 through 5, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now the prophet that, that Matthew wrote about here is the prophet Zechariah. That prophecy comes out of Zechariah 9, verse 9. And the prophecy is that this righteous one, this, this king, is going to enter Jerusalem one day, lowly and riding on a donkey. This prophecy became very commonly known among the Jewish people. They looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. They knew that one day their king would come riding in on a donkey. And so when Jesus decided to send his disciples to get that donkey and that colt, and to ride in on that donkey, he was declaring to his disciples, his followers, and to the people, I am God's Messiah. I am that coming king. This was the sign that, that the people were hoping for. Jesus was now ready to step into the ring and, and claim his rightful place as king of kings, as God's champion. However, as his followers waved their palm branches and shouted their hosannas, they assumed that everything would go smoothly. They, they, they assumed everything would fall into place. The people's eyes would be opened. The, the, authority, the authorities miraculously would understand, and, and they would crown Jesus as King of Kings. But it was not going to be that easy. If Jesus was going to be the champion of God's people, he would have to face off against some opponents. He would have to face off against the Roman authorities. He would have to face off against the Jewish religious leaders. And also the fickle crowd who could quickly be swayed from one side to the other from supporting to opposing Jesus. Now, most of you know who George Foreman is. He's the guy that sells grills. Some, some of you probably have a George Foreman grill. I do. Sitting down in my basement. I don't know if you know this or not. He was an Olympic heavyweight champion in boxing. George Foreman. That's how it works today, though. When, when he was younger, when he became a professional back in 1973, he walked around with a sneer on his face, unlike what he looks like here. It, it's almost as if he had a chip on his shoulder, uh, as if he was angry all the time. In 1973, he became the world champion by knocking out the beloved Joe Frazier. When I was a kid, I used to sit and listen to the radio, because a lot of these fights were not on television. I, I tuned in the radio and I listened to these Muhammad Ali fights and Joe Frazier fights. He knocked out the beloved Joe Frazier. The public did not like George Foreman. He seemed like an antisocial person. When Muhammad Ali, and there's a picture of him, sneering at us. When, when Muhammad Ali faced him in, in, a, in a boxing match, down in Zaire, Africa, and, and Muhammad Ali used what was called the rope-a-dope method against him. And I don't know if you know what that is. Muhammad Ali would stand back against the rope and take a bunch of punches, and, and George Foreman just punched himself out in this rope-a-dope uh, method. And Ali won the fight. The public went crazy. Uh, Ali was, was a better champion. 
the, the Ali was a champion they could support. Now, Foreman tried to make a comeback against Jimmy Young in Puerto Rico, and it was in, in, in a very hot, hot weather outside the stadium. He got beat. In the locker room after the fight, he suffered a heat stroke. He had a near-death experience. He claimed that he found himself in hell. It was a place of nothingness and despair. There he pleaded with God to help him. And, and he began to sense that God was telling him that he needed to turn his life around. He, he needed to repent from the things that he was doing wrong and trust in, in Christ as his Savior. So he survived that heat stroke. He became a dedicated disciple of Jesus Christ. He eventually became an ordained minister, began preaching the gospel. He would share his faith whenever he had opportunity to share his faith. He would often tell his people that in, in that fight against Jimmy Young, Jimmy knocked the devil right out of him. He opened up a youth center. He focused on his family. He focused on the church for 10 years. He, he was focused on ministry. Then in 1987, after being away from the ring for 10 years, at the age of 38, he began a comeback. His primary reason was he wanted to raise money to help fund this youth center that he started. And so, during this time, people began to notice how different he looked. His looks changed. His demeanor had changed. What in the world happened to George Foreman, that spirit man with the chip on his shoulder? He'd become warm and loving and caring. He was a happy man. People began to wonder what in the world happened to him. So on this come, comeback trail, it took years and, and lots of vows, but finally he received another opportunity at the World Championship title in 1993. He faced Michael Moore. Nobody gave him a chance. He was the underdog. His, his opponent was 19 years younger th than he was. For the first 10 rounds on all the judges' scorecard, Michael Moore was, was, was winning big time. Somehow, though, in, in the 10th round, George Foreman threw a short right that caught Michael Moore and sent him to the canvas for the 10 count. George Foreman again became the champion of the world at age 45. Instead of raising his hands in the air and parading around the ring seeking self-glory, he went to his corner and he fell on his knees and, and he prayed. As Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, by the world's standards, he was a long shot. He was an underdog. The Jewish religious leaders wanted him dead. The Roman authorities would not tolerate any Jew who claimed to be the Messiah. The common people wanted a Messiah, but they wanted a military Messiah who could defeat Rome. Jesus was a Messiah of peace. But despite the odds, Jesus rode humbly into the city, and he stepped into the ring. The battle that awaited him would not be pretty. There would be blood. Sacrifice and salvation it is hard, painful, dirty, excruciating work. It demands the willingness of a person to give all, to give 100%. What kind of love? is required from someone who is willing to step into the ring and take all the punishment and take all the devastating blows of my sin and, and your sin and the sins of the world. What kind of love is required to do that? Amazing love. And here's the amazing thing. God knew that our sin and the sin of the world would crush his son and kill him in that ring. He would fall to the canvas dead. The 
The world began to count him out one day, two days, three days. But wait a minute. The stone began to roll away. And Jesus emerged from that tomb alive. God's champion. He dealt a knockout blow to evil, to sin, to death. He became our champion. This morning, if you are uh, going through some hard times, if you're struggling with your own humanity, your weaknesses, if you are facing a difficult battle in life and you feel lower than low, Remember, we have a champion. He took all the blows that sin and death could offer. And then he delivered that knockout punch. With God's champion, we share in that great victory. With God's champion, we have risen from the mat of defeat to new life. Amen. Let's turn to our final hymn. Number one.